In this series, we're going to start today with in defense of medical heresy. In other words, why we should think outside the usual way of thinking about medical problems in order to help people out. We're seeing how we can help people uh, without staying inside that paradigm box. All data will be ignored if it does not fit the ruling paradigm. So it doesn't matter if you have 20 different studies showing that hypnotherapy works for irritable bowel syndrome. Doctors aren't going to prescribe it. And in fact, uh, so this is another one of the challenges with our system, is that it doesn't matter if the evidence and science shows that something can help you. All that matters is the standard of care. And if it's not the standard of care, then the insurance company can justify not paying for it uh, in that, it, at all. And they get away with it because the insurance company's bottom line is that it is a for-profit corporation. And its major obligation is to make a profit for its shareholders. Um, it ha simply has a contractual arrangement uh, with you all. And there's many strategies of how it tries to kind of fool you in that contract or get out of that contract. And we can have a whole discussion about insurance companies. Uh, but I read a very interesting article one time written by a doctor who was employed for 10 years by an insurance company. And this doctor got paid bonuses based upon the number of denials, the percentage of, of payments that, that, that uh, he or she denied. Uh, because every time he or she denied paying you, the company made more money. Uh, and some of the tri tricks they used is one is to make the the, the insurance policy is so complicated that you can't even read it and understand it. When's the last time any of you looked at your insurance policy? C can you read it? You know, and, and most people in this audience are really highly educated people. And, and, and I can't even read my own insurance policy that I have and understand it. Uh, another another uh, trick they use is just to routinely deny things. So they'll just deny it and make you fight for it. And on, even on the first round, 50% of people just accept that denial and don't fight for it. So they, they win all those cases. And then when you do f appeal it, who do you appeal to? We well, appeal to a board made up of their own people. Uh, so there, you know, there's no, there's no uh, independent third party that's going to decide whether your case gets paid or not. Some of the challenges we're dealing with is not really the doctors. What we're dealing with is these other powers that have a big bunch of money driving them. There's huge profits to be made in insurance. There's huge profits to be made in pharmaceutical medications. All the doctors I know are great people. They actually want to help you. You know, all your doctors I have really no critique with, except that they're being fooled. They are being victimized also to a certain extent. Now, they may be making a better take-home income than you while they're being victimized, but they're still kind of being put in this paradigm box and locked in there. And they're being locked in there in several mechanisms of action. Let me see what the next. Uh, they're, being, they're being locked in there, one, by peer pressure. Uh, and what I'm saying is that I think this is a cracked paradigm now. Uh, you know, these doctors look here and they say, well, which way am I going to go? They're being locked in here by peer pressure. If they do something different, the colleagues in their office or the colleagues in their hospital are going to say, why are you doing that? We recently had a, a patient go to an infectious disease doctor. An infectious disease doctor said, yes, I agree that you probably have chronic Lyme disease, but you know what? The doctors in my office and the doctors in my profession won't let me say that Lyme disease can be chronic and won't let me treat it. If I treat you, I'm going to come under peer pressure. I might lose my license. The medical board of North Carolina, each state gives a license to practice medicine, and they can take it away again. If, you're, if, if they think you're doing something you know, that is of more harm than benefit. And then the other thing is if a patient does have a bad outcome, and let's look at reality. Doctors are all human. Doctors are going to make mistakes, and even if they don't make a mistake, the patients are human, and some of them are going to have a bad outcome. You know, All patients eventually, if you treat 1,000 people, somebody's not going to do well, even if you do everything right. If you treated them within the standard of care in the community, you win the lawsuit. If you were doing something alternative or outside the standard of care, it's hard to defend because malpractice suits are always defined with the, about the standard of care 
in the community. So it doesn't matter if the standard of care in the community is killing people and something else is saving them, 99% of the time, that 1% of the time, uh, it makes that lawsuit very hard to defend if you're outside the standard of care. So, you know, we happen to think that that standard of care is, is broken and needs to be fixed. Sometimes we call it the standard of scare of medical practice in the community. Um, so how does science advance? It does not advance just slowly. It usually advances in kind of these leaps. So, and this is talked about in a book called uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in science, advances uh, are first ignored, and then they're ridiculed, and then they're persecuted, and then they're accepted as the establishment's own, as if they had been their own all along. And, and we're going to look at some examples of this. So the first example I want to talk about is Ignaz Semmelweis. Ignaz Semmelweis uh, was a medical doctor who died in 1865. Now, 1865, if you remember your history, is the same time the Civil War was happening. This wasn't that long ago. So Ignaz Semmelweis died a horrible, lonely death um, as a result of being persecuted uh, by the medical establishment and his uh, desire to advance the status quo of medicine. And the way this happened is uh, that he was quite a smart uh, gentleman, and he uh, died in a Viennese insane asylum. Uh, he died from injuries uh, that he uh, got by being uh, involuntarily committed there and beaten uh, by the guards and uh, water boarded. So why? What, what did he do to uh, deserve this? What offense had this uh, physician committed uh, to deserve this? Well, he suggested that doctors should wash their hands between doing a cadaver dissection and delivering a baby. So uh, the uh, proponents of the ruling medical paradigm were bitterly opposed to anything that didn't fit within their limited experience. This is a process called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means if you're really invested in something, it's hard to consider the possibility of some other information that doesn't quite fit with supporting the reality of this investment. So if I've spent $150,000 in 12 years of my life getting a medical education, I want to think that I have learned what's important to know to take care of patients. And it's hard for me to imagine that maybe vitamin C could help somebody, but they didn't teach me that in medical school. Or maybe washing my hands could save a life, but they didn't teach me that in medical school back in Vienna in the 1860s. So that's cognitive dissonance, is, is that you're really invested in something, and that creates a psychological barrier to hearing something else. Um, so here's more about Ignaz Semmelweis. At 28, he became an assistant in this hospital, in the maternity clinic. He was appalled by the mortality rate, of which 11 out of 12 patients were sometimes dying from infection. And this was not just an occasional one out of 100 person. This was a lot of people, the majority of people. People were untying themselves and trying to escape from these maternity wards. Uh, they begged to be discharged. And his conclusion is that the disease was being caused primarily by the decaying particles of flesh underneath the doctor's fingernails from going from autopsies to delivering babies. Uh, so he developed a uh, way to make a chloride of lime solution. Uh, so this is basically dunking your hands in, in bleach. Uh, so he, basically everything was rejected, and even though he was uh, achieving success, uh, dramatic success, it uh, didn't really matter. Uh, so he was uh, crushed by this, and the story goes that uh, he... he gave himself over to heavy drinking and prostitutes. Uh, he wrote angry open letters denouncing the prominent doctors as irresponsible murderers. And, and, re and uh, in response to that, they had him uh, committed to an insane asylum. Uh, he was involuntary, involuntarily committed. Uh, the guards attacked him. He had wounds. They became infected, and that's what killed him of blood poisoning. Uh, and it says here, not long after his death, but it was actually 30 years. About 30 years after uh, his discovery is when doctors started washing their hands. And what has changed is that now we have improved hygiene, and the technology of medicine has developed at an astonishing rate. Uh, what perhaps has not changed is the attitude of medicine. Has our objectivity increased? Are we embracing new ideas? Are we willing to admit when there's an error? Uh, 